So I, I very much feel that if Genta can be called, they call him the, the Picasso mm. of uh, watch design. And I think that's a, a title that is worth Genta having. Mm -hmm. Then Roth can be the Da Vinci. Mm. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of What You're Wearing. Today we have Gore Ricky, the Roth Father, also known as a High End Time on Instagram. Yeah, you got me. You didn't butcher my name. Finally. Usually I get Guava. Guava. You know, they run the spell check on it, and Gaurav becomes we'll Guava. Just call it's you crazy. Guava from now. On. <laughs> guava from now. Roth Father is better. Trust Roth me. Father. Okay. So why why do people call you the Roth Father? Yeah. So look, this is a very much a passion play for me. Right. I got into Roth at a very late stage. Unfortunately, I, I wish I had gotten earlier yeah. when prices were a lot more affordable than they are today. And um, it's just a passion play. And so before you know it, I start getting more and more rots. Mm. And then people start reaching out. I start reading up on them, develop a little bit of an expertise. And happy to say in the last six to seven months, some of the most important rots have passed through my hands. Wow. So it's almost like they come to me, I bless them, and then they go out into the world. You know, and hence the name, the Roth Father. I, this was coined by a couple of really good friends. Yeah. So, and I owe it. To be honest, I owe it to the community. Mm -hmm. You know, for for kind of giving me this, this this title. Um, but that's how the name is. So, I mean, I, I like the moniker Roth Father. Yeah. But but it's left me very poor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I love them. Yeah. I love them all. So, I don't really know that much about Roth. Yeah. Why why Roth specifically? Why do you like it so much? And why do you think the brand has started to see some appreciation in recent times as, as compared to previously? So there's many reasons, you know, with the, why Roth is what it is today. But I think we should start with perhaps three key factors. Mm. So the first is quality. You're talking about a person that was not only influenced by the very best of the best, but he used the very best of the best. So you know, all your movements were Lebania highly decorated mm. you know some of the best chronograph um, ever ever made uh, you know use the same movement Pathek has used the same movement in several mm. of its of its calibers mm -hmm. but again influenced by um, by some of the greatest watchmakers ever made so quality is number one you know I think the second I would say is rarity mm. Roth was an artisan so he didn't make too many watches um, you know by you know it was, there was no mass production Mm. Each watch was handmade, so you know, I think the quality is next to nothing. The the, the rarity, rarity of these pieces is next to nothing, mm. and uh, you know, and I think the the, the heritage of it is mm. the third thing. You're talking about someone who started his career at AP. Mm. He was the master watchmaker at Audemars Piguet. After Audemars Piguet went to resurrect Breguet, mm. and then after Breguet started his own venture with uh, with. Um, Daniel Roth under his own name. Mm -hmm. So you know, look at look at his heritage. Look at so I, I very much feel that if Genta can be called, they call him the the Picasso mm -hmm. of uh, watch design. And I think that's a a title that is worth Genta having. Mm -hmm. Then Roth can be the Da Vinci mm -hmm. uh, because he literally is of the same caliber. In fact, they work together, as I said, on many many interesting pieces. So, so obviously, the main three factors: quality, rarity, and heritage. Heritage. Yeah. So you mentioned about heritage of Roth, but. Uh, what is the heritage of Roth? Tell me a little bit about the history. There are three periods of Roth. So, you know, we're talking about an artist. So I think we should talk in the language of art, essentially, right? So just like in art, you have the Renaissance period, mm. some of the great masters. You then have neoclassical art, right? And then it's preceded by the modern art period. Roth has the same three periods. So the Renaissance period of Roth was from 1988, roughly, to 1994. Mm. This is when he was very much in charge of his own destiny. And you know, this was an artist running a business. Every piece was meticulously finished. And some of the best pieces come from that first period. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the other periods are not as important, right? Then he couldn't, you know, it, it wasn't a commercial success. Then came the second period of Roth, the neoclassical Roth, which is the hourglass period of Roth, mm -hmm. where Again, the movements were slightly lower quality, not by much. They still use pretty good movements. He was involved in a few models, acutely so, but not in all of them. The reins were handed over to the Hourglass Company of Singapore that pretty much ran the brand. Um, and they couldn't handle it either. 
and then there was the third period of wrath, which is from 99 onwards, which was Bulgari, where Bulgari came in, swooped them up, and then obviously, I think within three years, there were a couple of models that were pretty good, even in that period, mm -hmm. but kind of after, after a couple of years, it amalgamated into kind of the Bulgari language mm -hmm. of um, some of their, you know, like the Papillon, post-Papillon mm -hmm. pieces mm -hmm. that Bulgari started making. So those are the three periods of Roth. But you touched a little bit upon why the, the brand wasn't really a commercial success. Why do you think that was the case? What happened? So look, there's a number of reasons for it, right? The first is you're giving an artist the reins of a business. Mm. You know, artists are be best at art. You know, you can't really have them run a business. I mean, they're not as commercially minded. There's, look, there's, we are always conflicted or faced with constraints. And what a businessman would choose is very different than what an artist would choose. So if, if, if I had to choose between commercial um, result or return and quality, I as a businessman may choose commercial return. Roth always chose quality, mm. always chose the artist's path. So that was one reason. But I think the other is, some of, those, some of the pieces were, you know, 55, 60,000 Swiss franc. Now I went back and just did a check on what is the value of 55,000 or 60,000 Swiss franc in 1988 or 1989. And the average US salary, or kind of like of a, of a reasonably good earner, was 30 to 35,000 Swiss franc. A house was under 100,000 Swiss francs. Mm. You know, so imagine this was a watch in 89 that cost, that the, cost the price of a house. I mean, the thing is, imagine spending that money on a watch. Mm. That also in 1990, when watches were not what, it, what, it, what they are today. Mm. So obviously you've collected Ross for so long. Uh, you, do you have any advice to impart on people who are aspiring to collect Ross? What should people be looking for? I mean, the first thing I'd say is always buy full sets. Mm. Even if the papers are blank, as long as you have a manual describing the actual model number, I have seen some tinkering going on uh, in, in this space. Not too much, because there were not too many produced in the mm. first place, but I have seen a few that have been tinkered with. What um, you exactly do you mean when you say tinkering? Well, Silas at Collected Man had an article on, on one of the split second chronos where the actual movement um, went out, apparently. Some watchmaker bought a, series, a set of Venus movements, which were then swapped out in terms of different parts. And therefore, whilst it was a piece that was actually produced in 1990, they were selling the split second in the 2000s. Mm. But not all of them in the 2000s were actually, you know, in my opinion, completely legit mm. because of this batch of movements. So there have been cases of movements been leaking out. So I bought, I bought a lot of certificates. And you look at the certificates, they're very detailed. So try to find Roths. I've seen some weird stuff. I mean, I've seen a Roth, for example, in two-tone with different color lugs. Oh, okay. So the watch was white gold, the lugs were yellow gold. Yeah. And well, that clearly doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? Because yeah. a lot of the papers I have are single metal. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen any of the papers that have, that have different? Not yet. So far, all the papers are single metal. Well, actually, you know, honestly, I have one piece, Sean Song, of S Song watches sold one where the crown and the buttons were different mm. color, so it was two tone. Uh, that had papers, mm. so I have seen that. But other than that, not too many. I mean, this was a weird piece, right? The lugs were a totally different color. Right, right, right. Um, rots by itself are quite rare, but you know, just be careful. Buy the seller, mm. get provenance. Uh, if you can't find the papers, at least make sure it has the manual, mm. and the manual describes the watch that you're actually buying. So that's, that's actually a really good, I think, piece of advice to Roth collectors. Right. My advice to general collectors or general sort of new vintage collectors would be really, I mean, I know it's been quoted a lot of times, but you know, in the Rumi, which is this Persian uh, book the po of poetry, there's a saying, what you seek is seeking you. Mm. So I honestly believe this is the best advice I can give. I mean, literally, if you really, truly love it, I believe the watches will find you.